do you remember last time we were in, in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, and I finished my, 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 the last point of, of my sermon that was, you know, I, I've tried to go as far as I could, but I couldn't because I went as far as the second verse <laughs> of the book. Today, we will not go further than the third, so, but don't worry, I'm not doing this, you know, so in this pace, we will finish Hebrews in three or four years, but I'm not doing this, but this is so intense, it's so interesting, and the last part that I, uh, I, I stopped there was that um, in the last days, God has spoken to us by His Son, and if you remember, I said that he will go as far as it gets personal. And God, for God, speaking to us was not like, okay, I will give you this Bible and deal with it. No, was I will send my son. It's very personal. The word of God is personal to him. Jesus Christ was the most personal uh, discourse speech that God had toward us. After saying this, the, the, the author of the letter declares some things about the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that are so spectacular. Um, these three statements, he, uh, you will see there are three statements about Jesus, and these three statements were never articulated about any other man. And you know what? Nobody would pretend to have these characteristics. They are the, either the biggest lie in the history or the biggest truth in the history. There is no middle ground here. Biggest lie or biggest truth. Nobody said anything like this about any other man before the author of the letter and not neither after, so before and after him. If these characteristics that are said about Jesus Christ are a lie, then it, at least to me, it is hard to believe that nobody proved them a lie. Some people, they really don't believe it. Some people will say, yeah, I have some doubts. But you know what? Up to now, nobody said, this is a lie. And prove it. And you will see why it's so hard to prove it. Why? Uh, somebody would doubt these characteristics of, uh, about Jesus because he was a man like us, like me and you. I mean, Jesus was born like us, tired like us, tempted like us, going to the restroom like us, eating like us, perspiring like us, having tooth pain like us, bleeding like us, playing as a child, like us, although some books said that when he was a little, he made out of the dirt, he made uh, dirt, he made uh, uh, pigeons or something like that, he, he breathed a life in them and they flew, I, I mean this is, there are at least two books saying this, but this is not true. Well. Uh, he was uh, washing like us. Uh, he worked hard. And I mean hard work. Not like all of us, but <laughs> he really worked hard. Uh, his his uh, work was really hard. And uh, he wore clothes like us. And he wore sandals. Yeah. He was God in sandals. Imagine this. But something was different. He didn't joke like us. Um, he didn't talk like us. If you read some of these uh, uh, sayings are, I mean, so different than us. He didn't sin like us. Actually, he, didn't, he never sinned. He didn't forgive like us. Who forgives his you know, killers. He did it. Um, he didn't read the scripture like us. It was a special way he treated the scripture because actually he wrote the scriptures. <laughs> he was the scriptures. 
He didn't resist arrest like some of us would. Um, you know, Jesus never glow in the dark like he was special. And he didn't, when he walked, he didn't levitate. He really walked in the dirt. So, um, yeah, he was God, the different one. He was God man. Jesus, a person with this description, normal by any standard of like human standard, he claimed to be God on earth. He said that several times. He said, I am God. Today, when somebody says this, we lock them up. The best scenario is, man, you are lunatic. It's impossible. But Jesus, interesting, backed up his claims to be God on earth with miracles, with scriptures, with a sinless life, with a perfect record of righteousness given by the law, with over 300 prophecies that he fulfilled. You know, he backed up all this claim that he was God. He was the son of God, like an Israelite was the son of Israel. You know what it means, right? When you say, oh, you are a son of Israel, you are an Israelite. Uh, you are a son of uh, South Africa. What does it mean? Well, you are the son of God. That means you are God. So he, when he said, yes, I am the son of the Almighty One, the Holy One, then he said, I am God. I'm, um, let's read the second part of verse 3. Well, actually, I will start with verse 2, the second part of verse 2, when he said, um, but last, but in these last days has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is the word of God. And um, today I would like, my, my, my point I would like to emphasize is utter lie or sober truth. There is no middle ground. Utter lie, either is a, an utter lie or a sober truth. Well, and the first thing that I would like to emphasize is actually what the, the, the author of the letter emphasized is that Jesus is his relationship with the creation. His relationship with the creation. Jesus, it says here, is the heir of all things. He will control the whole world. This is future now. This world will belong to Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't belong to Jesus Christ, but it will belong to Jesus Christ. This uh, is the end, the end. Uh, and we know this end from the scriptures. Jesus will rule. Not the Americans, not the Chinese. Sorry for that, not the EU. <laughs> not the Russians. You know, everybody thinks, oh, if they will do this and that. You know what? Who will rule this earth is Jesus Christ. Praise His name. Amen. We are on the right side. <laughs> um, um, I've preached about this earlier, and I don't want to talk about this anymore. But just, we will be co-heir with Him. So he, we will inherit everything. But why? Because He in, will inherit everything. Jesus will have the end of this creation in his hands, and he will also, as he has the beginning of this creation in his hands. And, and he says this, yes, he, appointed, he was appointed the heir of all things, thou whom also he created the, the world. Uh, Jesus created, through him was created the whole earth. Um, the periodic table was made by Jesus and discovered by Mendeleev. Um, the law of gravity 
was made by Jesus and we discovered it. Now, some people, even, you know, physicians, they say, we don't even know what is this. <laughs> we know that there is, but we can't even define it. Uh, the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus was walking on the waters, you remember, uh, during that storm? That, that sea, that water was made by Jesus. The Temple Mount where Isaac was almost sacrificed, Solomon built the temple, and Jesus cleansed the temple. That mountain was made by Jesus. Uh, the species that, you know, Jesus was crucified. You know who created that species of wood where Jesus, you know, was crucified on? Jesus. Je through him was created everything. Jesus not just made the world, not he will own the world, but you know what? Jesus, that we live in, Jesus has everything in control. Actually, he upholds the universe with the, the word of his power. This is what, what Hebrews says. But verse 3, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Um, the word to uphold means to carry, to bear. Yes, means to sustain, but that means that also you carry toward something. And we know toward what is carried this world. He created. He carry, uphold, sustains, and carry to that point, and he will own the whole world, and he will end the world. And you know what? He will make a new world. So Jesus is the center of everything. Now, um, our life is very much influenced by the moon. And I did a little bit of research. The moon influences the tide. Uh, you know, uh, by its gravitational force. And the earth oceans facing the moon, I, and this is not, it's, it's a quote, I took it from somewhere, I'm not so smart, so I'm, I will read it, you will see, I'll read it, it's not mine. But it says there, the earth oceans facing the moon bulge up in response to the lunar gravitational force, a high tide. The difference in gravitational attraction on the near and the far sides of the earth means that at the same time, there is also a high tide on the side furthest from the moon. So if the moon is here, you have a high tide here, you have a high tide here, and you have a low tide in the other parts. So it's so interesting. I was like, yeah, that's great. But, uh, and then I read on and on, you, you do the research. Uh, tides influence species, all sorts of species, species of animals. The fishing. If there is no tide, the fishing would be hard. Um, and even surfing. Well, but some people, they don't care about surfing. The moon influence also the stability of the earth rotation. Now, you know, the, the earth is tilted, right? But it spins. But when it spins, also it wobbles like this. So the moon has an influence on this wobble because otherwise it could go like this and but because of the moon this wall will be just 2.4 degrees no more no less and I was like what more or less this wobble uh, would create if it's not would uh, create apocalyptic scenarios but it's not why well, because Jesus upholds the moon right in the, in the right position, exact in the right position. Otherwise, life would be very hard here on earth. And then I did a, another research because I knew this. You know, you know everything in this mo universe moves. Everything. There is no such a thing of no moving. You are not moving now. Maybe you move your hand. But when you stand still, like in the song, 
you don't move, okay? But actually you are moving. We all are moving. And here is what, um, and there is a, a video on YouTube, this guy said this, that we are moving uh, uh, 1,600 kilometers per hour because of the rotation of the, uh, the Earth. The moving around, you know, we, we move like this, but also we move around the sun. And because of that, gives us another 107,000 kilometers per hour. Then the sun is moving toward another star. So while the sun moves like this, the, word, the, the earth moves like this, okay? Imagine? So the sun moves like this. The earth moves like this, but also the moon spins, and <laughs> the, 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 the earth spins. Crazy. And we are not in the, in the space. We are still here. God is wonderful. So, okay, so um, the, the sun gives another 107,000, and then uh, the sun moves, and that gives another 72, 420 kilometers per hour. The solar system moves with 885,000 kilometers per hour in the Milky Way galaxy, and our galaxy moves in space with 3,600,000 kilometers per hour, per hour toward other galaxies. To add all of these, we will get 4,595,000 kilometers per hour, that means 1,280 kilometers per second. So last second when you, you have not moved at all, <laughs> actually you moved with 1,280 kilometers per second. Everything moves in this universe. You know, when I, I found out this, I was like, and nothing collides? And nothing collides. You know why? It's uphold by Jesus. With what? Now, interesting, if you look into this, I, I don't know if you found it interesting, but I did. It doesn't say, and he upholds the universe by the power of his word. You see, it's, it's, it's the other way around. By the word of his power. And I'm like, okay, so Jesus has a power, and that power talks, has words. And the universe is upheld by these words. That blew my, my mind. <laughs> and believe me, don't ask me, I have, I have no idea what does it mean. But this is what, through direct revelation, and I believe it's true. And, oh, sorry. So the whole universe moves. The earth is traveling through space with the sun, with the galaxy, and with the whole universe. And all this movement and the move goes around the world. And everything is in Jesus. You know, to uphold means to be in his hand. Jesus holds everything. As I hold my Bible, Jesus holds everything in place. I believe this is pretty awesome. If you never thought about Jesus in this way, now you have a new perspective on Jesus. Jesus is really powerful. And to connect, David, to connect what you said earlier, you know, when you have, we have problems, and we have, and we are scared, and we are, and we don't go to Jesus, then we think that we can uphold all these problems and solve them. But actually, if, he, if we would go first to Him, I mean, this is nothing. Imagine the, the whole uh, complex of universe. And this is even nothing for Him because He upholds this with the word of His power. How do you feel now? After, after, well, after this, how do you feel now? I felt insignificant. 
I, had, I felt so little, so small, that I thought, you know what, I... But I felt protected also. Because if he started, if he ends, and he <coughs> upholds, and the, the way the, the world goes in that direction and is because of him, I feel protected. By who? By a God-man. By a God-man who sat near the well where the woman wondered how he will get the water. Remember the Samaritan water? <laughs> so with all this information, imagine <laughs> Jesus created everything, upholding everything, and, and then he's, he's tired, he's thirsty, and here the Samaritan woman comes and said, you, you know what, sir? I don't know how you will get this water from the well. <laughs> and Jesus made that water. And Jesus made the, the, the stones they used to make that well. And Jesus said, yeah, but I have living water. <laughs> so when you read, then, then, then when you have this in mind and read the scriptures, sometimes you start laughing. You're like, man, oh, you have no idea. You are so ignorant. And you know what? This is the ignorance of the mankind before the Creator. God is the Creator. <clears throat> Jesus created everything. Through Him was created everything. This is the best, I think this is one of the best illustrations of our ignorance when we talk about Jesus. Do you know Jesus? I know you are Christians. Do you know Christ Jesus? He is the one through whom the universe was created, the one who upholds this universe to work like a clock. And He is the, the, the heir of all things to whom all things will belong. And all things will belong to Him. When Jesus will rule the whole planet during the thousand year reign, this is just a small aspect of what He can do. Jesus is bigger than all you've ever imagined. Praise Him. It's, it's awesome. When you read, okay, um, have, I, I mean, I, I, I think you did. Psalm 2, Psalm 2 is a messianic, uh, uh, I, I think I have it here. Yeah. Um, if you read the whole Psalm 2, it's about this. I don't, I don't have time to read it all. But at the end of the Psalm, it says this. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. Lest he, uh, he be angry. And you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. When you have all these. And you know who created everything. Kiss the son. Have a special relationship with him. And you know what? When you, when you serve the Lord. You, when you serve the son. You are blessed by Him. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. But step outside of Him and you have all the troubles possible. Step outside of Him and you will say, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. <laughs> and Jesus, I mean, I don't think He left. But if I would be him, I would laugh. laugh. I'm, I'm not him, so I was like, you have no idea. We well, would have no idea what you're talking about. So Jesus is, Hebrews, like, let's go back to Hebrews uh, 1. Jesus is the, the end, the beginning, and the sustainer of all, all creation. This is the relationship with him, with the, of him with the relation. It's a lie or it's a truth? Well... Some people will say it's a lie, but they can prove. But we can prove because He transformed our lives. And because this is a collection of historical documents. But let's go um, to the second thing, the second characteristic that Jesus, uh, it, uh, the, the, the author to, of the letter says about Jesus. And the next thing he says about Jesus is, sorry, I'm here. He is the radiance of the glory of God 
and the exact imprint of his nature. What are rays for the sun? Jesus is for the Father. The sunlight is not reflected. The sunlight is what? Directed. It's the direct radiance of the sun. Jesus sun shines God for all to understand the Father. You want to understand the Father? Just look at Jesus. When we look in the sun, we become blind. But you can see the sun rays, right? This is like with Jesus. If you would look at the Father, you would die. So this is why the exact radiance of God, the Father, is Jesus Christ. Look at Jesus. What do you see? Love. Sacrifice. Humility. But he talks about the glory. And when, when you talk about the glory, then you think, oh, he's kind of a proud about this. But no, Jesus was not. Um, the Son is the splendor of the Father. Remember at the uh, uh, wedding in Cana? He showed his glory. It says, just read John uh, 2 11 he shows him when when he transformed the water in the best wine possible then when he raised Lazarus and he said come out and Lazarus came out from dead he showed his glory but it was another situation when he showed his glory and and Peter didn't know what to say <laughs> you remember on the mount when Jesus transfigured and his clothes became transparent and his face and everything that light was so intense that was transparent Peter said whoa this is great we're here <laughs> let's make some some uh, tents you see it's not that we speak so so many foolish things when we don't this is why I don't think we have so many you know, experiences like face-to-face -face with God because we would talk foolish things. But we have the Word of God. And we know what other people did. But they saw Jesus glorified. John, John the Apostle saw Jesus glorified and he didn't recognize him because he was awesome. And then he fell down. <laughs> Indeed, when Jesus did all these things, you saw the Father. But the best place where you see the exact nature of the Father in Jesus Christ is at the cross. At the cross. There you see the glorification of the glory of God, the splendor, the majestic splendor of God. The deepest revelation of God, Father's heart, or who He is on the cross. When Jesus was on the cross. This is the radiance of the true nature of the Father. The Father is a life-giving, life-sharing, life-transforming Father. And you see that in Jesus. You want to see the Father? Look at Jesus. And also it says He is not just the, the radiance of the glory, the splendor of God, but... He is the imp exact imprint of His nature. And this is why I showed you here some ways to imprint things. So this is the ray and the, the sun, sorry. And this is the imprint, exact imprint. Or here, when you brand animals. And here, when you have a wood or a, a wax that you put, like a seal or something, you have the, that exact imprint. This is Jesus, the exact imprint that means He is God. He is God. Nobody saw the Father, but Jesus is the exact imprint of His nature. And He exegetes God for us, the Father. Without the Son, the Father would be a mystery. Jesus made that mystery known to us. And... Um, to know God is one of what, what, what the disciples do. To know God. You know why we 
are able to know God because of Jesus Christ. Without, we can't. It's impossible. Um, when they, interesting, when they saw Jesus as the exact imprint of the Father, you know what they did with him? They killed him. They killed him. The, the sun was too hot. The image was too disturbing. And they destroyed it. They don't, didn't want to. They, they took an umbrella. And we don't want to see the sun. They took a hammer. They smashed that image. Why? They didn't want it. But how about, so, but, but we are talking about the sinners. What about the apostles? And this is what Philip said. Remember what he said? Lord, show us the Father. And it is enough for us. <laughs> and Jesus said, I am, I, I am the Father. Look at me and you see the Father. What? Do you think you are better than Philip? I don't know about you, but I would say the same thing. Sometimes we say stupid things because we are ignorant. <coughs> Knowing that Jesus is the radiance and the imprint of the Father, how this will change your life during this week, I don't know. But you will find out. Your life will be different from the last week because you know that Jesus is the one who, through Him, was everything was created and He upholds everything. And, and He is the perfect uh, representation of the Father. But, I don't know. Some people will say, oh, this is an utter lie. I would say this is the best truth possible. There is a three, the third characteristic here. And he says this. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is Savior and he is Sovereign. This is the relationship between Jesus and redemption. So you have the relationship between Jesus and creation, re the relationship between Jesus and revelation of God, and then with the redemption. And He is Savior and He is Sovereign. You see the cross and the crown there, both of them. He is Savior, He died, but He is Sovereign, He is the King. Jesus made purification for sins by giving his life to pay for these sins. This was voluntary. Nobody pushed him to do this. He wanted to do it. Nobody compelled him to do it. It was voluntary. The purpose was the substitutionary uh, um, uh, sacrifice. He, that means he paid us our sins. And then he, do you see what is next here? What he did next after he paid for the sins? He sat down. Now, you know, in the Old Testament, there is no rest for the priests. Why? Because they know somebody else will come back with another lamb, and they will kill another lamb. There is no rest for the, the, the Old Testament priests and, and, and high priests. But look at Jesus. After he paid for the sins, he sat down. All done. Our atonement, our atonement was done. He never had to go back and do it again. Once for all. We'll learn more about this in the book of Hebrews. But where he sat down? On a throne. Priest and also king, priest and king. The right hand of the majesty on high. This is the resurrection. When he resurrected, he died, and he, right now he's sitting on the right hand God of God. Right now he's right there. First the cross and then the crown. From, he, from there he controls the whole universe, the whole history, and you know what? The whole church. Yay. He controls the church. He controls the universe and the history. Jesus saves you. Praise God.
but He is also the sovereign of your life. And the question is, are you saved? But then the next question near it, very quick, is He the Lord of your life? Is the sovereign? That's a good question. The right hand of Father is a position of power, authority, and honor. This position is of a victorious Savior. Victorious Savior, not a defeated seditionary. Because he was on the cross, he was killed and, and crucified like a seditioner. He, they thought he wanted to start a, a new revolution. Was not defeated, was actually paying for our sins. This is ignorance, the ignorance of the mankind before God. Uh, we don't know. Sometimes people say, we don't know, what is next? Uh, people are saying that they are Christians, they say, are you safe? We don't know. It's not possible. A lot of people from the Orthodox, from the Catholic Church, if you ask them, they say, we don't know. But we know. And the problem is, if you know what's happening, in your life. Is He also the Sovereign, the Lord? Um, so, the conclusion is this, I guess, and it was a pretty long sermon, sorry for that. Jesus is superior. Remember how He started? Long ago, He spoke to the prophets. But Jesus is way much better than the prophets. Why? Because of his relationship with the creation, his relationship with the revelation, and the relationship with the redemption. Moses. Um, let's take some prophets. Moses. Moses spoke about the creation. Jesus did the creation. Some uh, uh, prophets talked about um, God, what He wants. He was God. And some priests would bring sacrifices. He was the last sacrifice. All done. And He resurrected. Jesus had no equal. Why should try something else? Why should some people repel Him? It's stupid. It's dangerous. Is scandalous. Accept Jesus, worship Jesus, rest in Jesus. Why? Because He created, He upholds, He will end up. And you know what? He is God. And you know what? He is the King. Other lie or sober truth? I would go with sober truth. How do you know? By faith. I have some facts, but I choose to believe in Abraham because he chose to believe. <coughs> it was credited righteousness to him. And we thank God because he did that to us. So, you, if you are still thinking it's a lie or a truth, there is no mid, middle ground. You need to choose what you do. And what you do with Jesus is, it's the definition of what will happen afterwards. And this is all about in the book of Hebrews. I hope we will take more verses for next time. You know, we'll go, it's not like every time we take two verses, we are not. But these two, like the first three verses were so embedded, so rich, it, it would be pity just to fly through them. Today we've learned something very important. And I hope this, the next week, the, the week that we are starting today, tomorrow and, and, and Monday and everything, uh, your life will be different and my life will be different because we know who Jesus is. Amen.